and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from beautiful Blue Sky, San Diego. San Diego, San Diego. Uh, and today I'm joined by Tatiana Sawyer, who is in New York. How are you doing, Tatiana? I'm doing great. How are you? Excellent, excellent. And you have a book coming out at the beginning of next year, right? Dream Bold, Start Smart. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. And um, what we want to talk about today is, you know, don't fake it till you make it uh, when it comes to numbers, money and taxes. So, you know, people are always saying, oh, you yeah, know, fake it till you make it. Why is that a bad idea when it comes to numbers, money and taxes? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a bad idea because um, it never serves you. So there are things that you can kind of avoid and kind of um, neglect um, <laughs> mm -hmm. for a while, but you know, and sometimes things find a way to work themselves out, but it doesn't apply to money. If you ignore money, numbers, taxes, it will never, it will just keep accumulating and, and have like a snowball effect basically. Right. So what is your what is your advice to people who, let's face it, when it comes to things and especially, you know, business, small businesses or solopreneurs or anything like that, um, you know, they want to get on with the, the business that they're in. They're excited about that. They don't really want to deal or they, they cringe at dealing with that other stuff. So how do you get over that and sort of realize that that's that's all part and parcel of the game? You know, I like to say um, it's just numbers. Mm -hmm. So I, I've worked with clients for 15 years and I hear the same thing kind of over and over again, that some people say they hate dealing with this um, stuff. Some people say, uh, I've never, I've never been good with money. I've never been good with numbers, math or whatever else it may be, but it's just numbers. So mm -hmm. there's not nothing scary. If you're not doing anything illegal, right. You, it's, there's nothing to be scared about. And people who are honest people tell me sometimes, oh, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to do something wrong mm -hmm. and go to jail. And I'm like, you're not going to go to jail. Don't worry. It's not that serious. You will only, right. <laughs> someone can only go to jail if they're deliberately doing something very, very wrong. So when mm -hmm. it comes to taxes, you have to file. Even if you can't pay, you have to file. It's, it's simple as that. So what are some of the things when, when you talk to people, what are some of the things that small businesses or, as I said, sole, solopreneurs or whatever, what are some of the things that they can do um, when it comes to their, their finances and their taxes that maybe it's not obvious to them? Um, some of the th simple things. So I typically work with smaller small business owners, but that mm -hmm. also includes freelancers, um, right someone who has a side gig maybe uh, so th those folks don't necessarily call themselves entrepreneurs yeah. sometimes they do sometimes they don't but when whenever that happens it's i call it a business because it is a mm -hmm. business so one thing that is not really obvious that not a lot of people talk about um is separating business and personal yeah it, even if it's just um even if you're working under your own name getting a designated business card credit card um for business purposes only is the number one step getting a separate mm -hmm. checking account for a business only transactions will not only um save you headaches kind of at the end of the year when you're trying to um compile numbers for taxes right. but it will also if you get audited it's much easier for you to make an argument um, to the IRS and say, listen, I use this account for business only. It's not personal. So if I spent it on X and X, it means that there was a business purpose for it. Yeah, because um, because I think that's one of the, as you said, I think that's one of the number one um, things that people do is end up co-mingling, right? Co-mingling yeah. their, their personal and their, their business. And as you say, then it becomes very difficult then you're as you say you're then saying oh no yeah i know this is a per in my personal one but this is actually a business expense and oh that one in the business well that actually yeah you're right that was a personal <laughs> expense and all you're doing is really kind of creating problems for yourself right because now your auditor exactly. the auditors are going oh, okay let's see um so that's a good that's a that's a great uh, that's a great piece of advice i think the other thing then is that people probably don't always understand what or really understand what's a legitimate business expense from what's not yeah there is a lot of um there's a sea of information um mm -hmm. online about all of this there are different articles mm -hmm. and different things 
Um, and the rule of thumb, we as preparers, we as accountants advise uh, our clients is we usually say, well, if another reasonable business owner was m managing your business, would they think that this expense is ordinary and necessary? That's the actually right. the IRS wording, but mm -hmm. would someone who's a savvy business owner spend money um, to get income um, in this manner? If the answer is yes, then it's probably deductible. So you may, it doesn't matter what you really call it, except for maybe a couple of things like meals, which is important to classify as meals because they're only 50% deductible. Mm -hmm. But when it's other things, so if you call it printing and reproduction or promotional item, it doesn't make that much of a difference. You still get a deduction for it. Mm -hmm. So typically and, that's the rule of thumb. <laughs> and then obviously record keeping is critical. And that, sh and let's face it, in today's day and age, you should really have no excuse for record keeping <laughs> given that everything can be done digitally. But I bet that's something that you have lots of conversations about is uh, keeping good records. Yeah, I'm a, a very strict when it comes to record keeping because I want my clients to be protected. Mm -hmm. So I typically, you know, we typically I work with QuickBooks Online just because it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an easy product. I have most of my clients there. I don't have to go to their office. Um, we can easily look at stuff at the same time remotely, especially now. Um, the more virtual we all go, the easier it is. But um, typically, I ask people to depending on what they're using, if they're using QuickBooks Online to adopt one approach, if they're not, if they're just using Excel, then to adopt another approach so I can talk a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. So for QuickBooks Online, it allows you to attach receipts and other software products to do that as well, like yeah. Xero and other. Um, so I, I'm very strict when it comes to attaching receipts. So most of my clients keep their receipts attached within QuickBooks so that if there's an audit, the auditor will say, oh, um, give me the receipts for these and these and these legal bills, for example, and you just download them all and just ship, ship them off and that's it. You're done. If you're just managing your finances kind of in an Excel format, which a lot of people do when they start out sure. or when it's a side gig or a freelance, um, then what I recommend is keep receipts in a folder for every year, for like every calendar year. You don't have to sort them as mm -hmm. long as you have kind of um, categories separated and you know, oh, I spent $1,000 on rent, $500 on X, office supplies or whatever it is. So keep receipts in the folder. And then if you get audited for that year, then you'll go back and organize mm. and sort. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the last thing you want is like, uh, is to get audited for some previous year and then have to spend a year trying to find the stuff from that year. <laughs> and, that, um, and that happens. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess the other part is as well is, um, I, I mean, setting aside time on a regular basis to make sure all of this stuff is kept up to date as opposed to, I mean, I presume you have, you've had clients in the past who come to you like, you know, two weeks before the end of the, the, the fiscal year and go, oh, oh help me. <laughs> well, I don't actually have those anymore because, yes. um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have sure have seen my share of, of mm -hmm. those. Um, and I just encourage people, I say, listen, if you just wait until the end of the year, uh, what you're creating for yourself, maybe you're okay just spending three days in a nightmare um, situation and then kind mm -hmm. of doing it once a year is works for you. But first of all, um, when you have that situation, the accountant kind of is pressured for time and we can do a great job for you, meaning yeah. we're more likely to make a mistake. You're more likely to forget an expense. So I am a huge fan of doing stuff regularly. So it's just numbers. Do it on weekly or monthly basis. Whatever your groove is, find it and just um, pay some attention because it's so much easier to remember something that happened um, a week ago as opposed to a year ago. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me then, um, what, what, um, based on all of this, what, what drove you to, to write the book and what can we look forward to? <laughs> so the book came as kind of a result of... Um, 15 years of working with people and as an accountant I always typically when a new client comes um, they often have let's say either a couple of scenarios so one would be book books QuickBooks or whatever another software books and records are not well 
done. So mm -hmm. there are negative numbers in reports, there are weird categories that were set up um, and stuff like that. So that happens all the time. And typically when that happens, you as an accountant have to do cleanup because we have our own standards. We have our own due diligence requirements, you know, set by the state, by the uh, federal government and so on. So typically um, this cleanup work isn't kind of like a necessary evil. So we right. have to do it. We hate doing it. Clients mm -hmm. hate paying for it. So there's that sure. waste of money and time that's <laughs> created. Um, and then same thing with tax kind of situation. Um, most attorneys, for example, recommend LLCs to small business owners. Um, so LLCs are set, set up left and right. Yeah. But from a tax perspective, LLCs are probably one of the worst um, entities that you could do. So I make a lot of money restructuring entities, restructuring so that people can actually pay less tax legally. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is also sort of a waste of money. I mean, it's nice uh, to be making sure. fees, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but who yeah. wants to redo, redo someone else's work? So typically, so, so the book came as a result of seeing these pains of getting the same questions from people who want to start a business, yeah. kind of having these different um, assumptions and misconceptions about, oh, I need a lawyer to start a business. No, you don't. You don't. Mm -hmm. You usually you don't. Sometimes yeah. in very specific, specific circumstances you do. Um, oh, I need to see um, to hire a team before I can launch a business. No, you don't. You can. You there are things that you can do to save yourself from failure and bulletproof your dream. So what I want to do with this book, and that's the book, the way the book was structured is to make sure that people who want to start a business, get that numbers, money and taxes, right, right yeah. from the start. If that happens, that all, all that money waste is reduced. We're all kind of doing what we love, working with clients and the clients actually get advice, not just service that they hate paying for and that they, you know, um, that just needs to be done. So, and also with the book, I tried to make it so that you know exactly when to hire a bookkeeper, exactly yeah. when to hire an accountant, how to find a good one, mm -hmm. be because all of that is super important. So what I want to do is I want to reduce the overall money waste and I want to give someone who might never take the leap into being their own boss, uh, give them a step-by-step -step process of how to do it and how to handle the back end of a business. Yeah, no, I love that because I think there's so many people who 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 want to do it, but then when they're confronted with the reality of it or what they perceive to be the reality of it, they think yeah. it, it it's so complicated and costly. And, yeah. you know, and, and as you say, they're like, oh, okay, so do I set up an LLC or do I go yeah. sole proprietor? Or do I see what's a C corp? And, and then you're going, and before you know it, you're just like, oh, this isn't for me because it's too yeah. complicated yeah. And, and I can't afford to pay people. So I think anything that demystifies it, because at the end of the day, um, if it's done properly, it's not that complicated, right? I mean, obviously, depending it's on what not. you're trying to do. It's not, but uh, there are a couple of things that I recommend doing and, and basically all of them are based on planning today for tomorrow, mm, yeah. whether it's thinking. So like one of my chapters, um, I talk about the entities uh, selection and I've developed my own matrix where um, just a regular small business starting out how you can easily decide what's right for you. And that involves mm -hmm. thinking about whether or not you want to sell this business in five years. Right. And, you know, so think about it today. And if there's a chance, then you will select this entity, if you definitely don't want to sell it, then you'll select another entity. Um, so there are different things that come into play, but the overall kind of the overarching topic is to plan for, for things ahead. Yeah. And I like that idea of, of figuring out where you want the business to go. Cause I think that's another thing. And I think people do this all the time is, is they think they have a vision and a dream or, or what they're doing, but they have actually really never thought it out. It's like, oh, I want to, I want to start my own business because I want to be my own boss and I think I'm really good. And, but to your point, it's like, do you want that to be a business that you do until you stop doing it? And then that business closes down and goes away. Or is that a business that you want to build up and you want to sell, or you want to bring partners into, or you want to expand and franchise? What is it you want to do? And I, I think a lot of people don't think of that before they start. Absolutely. 100%. Mm -hmm. And that's part of actually one of the book, the, the book is actually in two parts. So the first part is 
um, going through validating your idea, but from a numbers perspective and also from a long-term goal perspective and then right. talking about partners, investors, potentially, um, because I've actually never, I mean, it's a side note kind of, uh, but I ne never really um, thought about like, you know, if you're a small business, you don't need investors. But then my mm -hmm. clients said, one of my clients actually super smart guy, he said, well, you know, if you, if I can, I don't need the money. I will, this business will make it on its own. But if I can convince one person to write me a check for this, based on this business idea, that means there will be demand for my product or my service or whatever it yeah. is. So I thought, you know what? I mean, actually it makes a lot of sense. So the first part is kind of dealing with all of that. And by the end of the first part, you can realize that, you know, your idea needs further development. It's not good enough mm -hmm. yet. And yeah. then in the second part, you kind of go into like starting an entity and doing all of the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, because I think that's really important because as you said there, the first part, figuring out what you're going to do and then figure out, um, is it a scalable business? Uh, again, is it just going to be, I mean, if you're going to start up maybe a management consulting business, is that is that just going to be you? Yeah. Is that something that's going to be you dependent? And if it is, then you know, you're gonna you're gonna have to you know figure things out based on the fact that you're going to be the bottleneck and you're going to be the product. Or yeah. do you intend to build some IP and then have other people able to do the same thing that you do and build a you know build a group around it and you know hire people or whatever? But I think yeah. those are absolutely those are the things you have to you have to think through. And I think that's. Um, just like anything else, unless you think through those in some detail at the beginning, you're kind of drift. Yeah. 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 And there's a very high chance that for you to lose money if you don't mm. do your homework. So what I want to do is with the book is to prevent that from happening. So people who would otherwise not start a business actually feel empowered to do so and pursue yeah. their dreams and, but, but do it carefully and, you know, with a calculated step every time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's a, that's excellent advice. And, and just, yeah, just think it through. And if it's, if it's something that you want to do, I think you're great that you're demystifying it because I really do think that it's a great opportunity for people, but go in with your eyes open. And the other thing I always advise people to be honest in any endeavor, especially this is everything takes a little bit longer than you would like it to. So you might as well plan, realize that upfront and plan for it. So you can yeah. sit down and do your Excel spreadsheet and say, oh, that's great. Look, I'm going to be break even at the end of 12 months. Well, I would add six to 12 months after that, just to be honest, <laughs> because that's probably going to be more like the reality. Yeah, sure. I agree. Yeah. All right, listen, this has been great. The book is called Dream Bold and Start Smart, and it's coming out in March of next year, I think. Is yeah, yeah, absolutely, yep. Excellent. Okay, well, all of Tatiana's information will be here uh, in our contributor bio, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So um, I'm um, a CPA, I'm based out of New York, um, but I call myself a numbers expert because mm -hmm. realistically taxes and money is all about numbers. So I'm a numbers expert and I have about 15 years of experience working with small businesses and small business owners. And I help people be the boss of their bottom line uh, um, because ultimately it all comes down to that. <laughs> I love that boss of your bottom line because in many times like we all feel like the bottom line controls us, right? So I love that, I love that concept, <laughs> boss of the bottom line. All right, listen, thanks very much, Tatiana. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.